কিছু বলবেন ম্যাডাম প্লিজ কিছু আপনি শুরু করুন গুড মর্নিং एवरीवन অনরেবল স্পিকার ডক্টর প্রদীপ্ত ঘোষ Assistant Professor, Department of Physics, IIT Delhi, our respected Vice Principal, Dr. Shukratim Dash, IQSC Coordinator, Dr. Shamrat Bhattacharji, Barsar, Dr. Rajasri Ghosh, Senator Secretary, Dr. Vidisha Sinha, Teachers Council Secretary, Dr. Amita Puroy, Head of the Department, Physics, Dr. Joyita Chaudhuri, my respected colleagues and beloved students. I welcome you all in this series Hello? of webinars. Sir, Zoom meeting a joint Kurachanto. An introduction to the standard model in particle physics and beyond. I'm really delighted to have Dr. Pradipto Ghosh amongst us today. I'm thankful to him as he has given his consent to be the sole resource person for this series of webinars. The participants will be able to get a detailed exposure on particle physics through these deliberations, through his speeches. I would like to congratulate the Department of Physics of Scottish Church College, who has arranged such a series of lectures with the exact dates and times, which are already fixed and planned accordingly. This sort of approach will encourage the all other departments also to arrange such webinars. To note, in recent past, economics department, they have also arranged a series of lectures. Our IQSC team is doing a great job under the able leadership of Dr. Shamrat Bhattacharji. I'm really grateful to my IQSC team for arranging and presenting wonderful events like these to us one after another. Students, I know you are waiting for the time when you will be able to come to the Temple of Education, Scottish Church College. I hope this time is approaching. We all shall meet in the college again. But this event organizers organizing webinars will continue for all of us in future also. With this note, I would like to inaugurate today's webinar. All the best to all of you. Me Almighty bless all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for your kind words. Now I request our Vice Principal, sir, to serve a few words. Uh, a very good morning. Our esteemed speaker today, Dr. Pradeep Prabhosh, Assistant Professor of Physics at uh, IIT Delhi, the principal, my dear colleagues and uh, students. Uh, really, it's a pleasure that the uh, physics department, which is one of the more active departments in the college, they are organizing a three-part uh, lecture series on particle physics. And uh, if I'm not wrong, I was going through the program. Uh, Dr. Pradeep Tabhosh, uh, he will speak today, which is today is the debut lecture uh, on the prelude to the standard module in particle physics. On the next uh, Saturday, that is the second day, perhaps he will speak on the standard model itself and beyond it. And on the final day, if I'm not wrong, he will speak on uh, experimental physics. Now, of course, uh, I have 
practically no knowledge of physics, but as a social scientist, uh, I can understand the physical world. And I heard that uh, particle physicists are actually studying the world with a resolution, uh, which is uh, a billion times finer than atomic scales. So they are actually trying to uh, have a deeper understanding of uh, the everyday world and of the evolution of the universe. And uh, actually, I have also heard that uh, there are now revolutions in particle physics because they are entering into the world of experimental physics. So I am sure that uh, uh, Professor Ghosh's uh, lecture series will give a very, uh, very, very uh, good understanding of uh, particle physics and the standard model and its beyond, etc. I thank the physics department as usual and also the IQSC as the principal already mentioned for organizing such lecture series. Now, uh, it is true that uh, because of globalization today, we have the pandemic, but it is equally true that because of the pandemic today, we have a, a different kind of globalization in academics. Because now we have a galaxy of scholars in different departments, in different institutions, uh, because they have all been accessible because of our uh, seminars, webinars rather, on digital platforms. So I wish you all the best. I will not uh, waste any more time. Uh, I cordially welcome our speaker once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now the technical session, I request Dr. Joydeep Mitro to introduce the speaker and then, uh, please Joydeep. I'm audible. Uh -huh. So as, as you have already heard, uh, Dr. Pradipta Ghosh, uh, he works in the particle physics area, mainly worked uh, in the different aspects of uh, BSM physics, means beyond standard model physics, uh, starting from supersymmetry, neutrino, dark matter, and uh, many other topics uh, which is there in, in the LHC. Uh, Pradipta, after uh, graduating from uh, St. Javier's College, where uh, if I am not wrong, he was a rank holder in uh, University of Calcutta. He uh, did his uh, MSc from Rajabaja Science College. And after that, uh, he joined PhD in uh, Cultivation of Science, Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, and did his PhD there under the supervision of Dr. Uh, Utpal Chattopadhyay and uh, Shourav Roy. After that, uh, he was a postdoc fellow in the University of Madrid, and he worked with uh, the Carlos Munoz. Uh, who was a very big shot in, 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 in formulating the supergravity theory in the early 1980s. Then he was uh, in the France Ecole Polytechnique and he worked there under again, Emilian Dudas and Ian Brambeni, very two big shots uh, in, in, in the world of particle physics. Obviously he visited CERN, uh, ICTP and many other uh, leading uh, institutes, almost all the institutes in, in the particle physics around the world. And then he came back and uh, for a brief period of time, he was there as assistant professor in Vidyashagar College. And after that, he is now an assistant professor in IIT Delhi. Uh, he was a very passionate uh, teacher and a researcher. And on a personal note, uh, I can say, he was my friend and senior for let's say last 17, 18 years. Uh, in PhD days, we have spent the same workspace, not only the same workspace, uh, we, we, we spent the same mess room over, over five years. And uh, honestly, he's the hardest uh, working man uh, I know till date. Uh, you can't believe that he can work for hours and hours and I have never observed any decay in, in his passion uh, for particle physics. He's a great human being, have a lot of humor, 
and uh, when I asked him that you have to give a series of lectures, not only just a single webinar, you have to teach them. Uh, although he has a very busy schedule, uh, taking classes and doing the research works and other things, uh, he was he's uh, he readily accepted. Uh, the offer and then we have discussed uh, many things what to be done in this three set of lectures so you know, hopefully you will have a uh, very good time uh, and uh, so so without further delay so let's let's uh, let's uh, start uh, with Pradhupada. okay over to you so thank you very much uh, special thanks to the principal ma'am the vice principal sir the people associated with this IQAC to the HOD physics, Joita Di, and especially to all my friends, Chushobhan, Pradeeptoda, and especially to Jayadeep, with whom I have a long connection over the several past years. So thank you all for giving me this opportunity. So before I start, so I hope I'm clearly audible. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. So yes, before I start right. this, so there is a little bit of warning. So as advised by uh, the organizers, so I have tried to uh, prepare this talk almost without any equation. So um, in a in a nutshell, so I have, the way I have prepared this talk, it is more like you know understanding the world of particle physics, especially an introduction to the standard model of the particle physics from a layman viewpoint. So practically I haven't used any equation other than very elementary equation like Coulomb's law or Newton's laws of gravitation. So uh, if you uh, have good knowledge about the quantum field theory, group theory, and other advanced stuff like that, so I'm sorry, uh, you may figure it out a little bit disappointed. That's well, because I guess most of the, the attendants are actually from the undergraduate background. So I have prepared my talk accordingly. <clears throat> so in this series of uh, these three talks, so my plan is first to give you a brief introduction to the standard model. So what is particle physics? What is standard model? And what is so standard about this model? And then in the next uh, Saturday, so in the second uh, lecture, uh, the plan is that uh, what are the limitations of the standard model and why we need to look beyond the standard model. And finally, as I have discussed with uh, the organizers, so in the last lecture, that's on the 25th, so my plan is to discuss the current uh, experimental trend in high energy physics. So probably I will try to explore <coughs> experiment like LHC, a little bit of the neutrino physics, the dark matter experiment, and some flavor balloting experiments and things like that. So with further delay, let me share my slides and let's start the presentation. <coughs> so let me know whether you can see my screen. I hope you all can see my screen. Uh, yes, it is very much visible. Okay. So as I mentioned, so it's a series of lectures in the introduction to the standard model of particle physics and beyond. So beyond is something that we are going to discuss in the subsequent days, but today we'd like to wake up with an idea that is what is the standard model and how we can reach our ultimate goal, that is how we can formulate the standard model of the particle physics. Now, <clears throat> Since it is about the standard model, so, and as I mentioned that uh, thanks to the organizer, I have prepared this talk in the very elementary level. So the first thing that I would like to know that why do we need a standard model? So the important question is that whenever we would like to explore or we would like to understand what is happening around us, we actually need some framework. For example, you all know from your school days that this famous story of this apple falling on the head of the Newton, which actually motivates him to derive or to discover the laws of gravitation. Of course, we know that now <coughs> there are corrections to this Newtonian gravity and things like that, but I'm not planning to discuss those things. So basically, 
whenever we see some events or a series of events around us, we need a framework or a model to investigate that thing because we want to understand whatever happening around us in terms of a few fundamental ingredients or constituents. And that eventually, either it may lead to a theoretical framework, which is often known as a model. I mean, for example, as you know, like there are several experiments going on to, uh, to prove the idea of the astrophysics and cosmology. And I mean, we have also discovered these gravitational waves. I mean, one of this is actually through this Indian collaboration. <clears throat> so that is the reason we actually need to have some framework or some platform based on which or a set of law based on which we can explore or we can examine the world around us. Now, <clears throat> there are two things which are extremely important that why we need to have a framework to understand something. To start with, I would like to present some things which is very, very recent and some things which has frightened us, all of us. So you can see that so this is actually, so I'm talking about this infamous novel coronavirus. And you know that even to discover this much desired vaccine, okay, now there are a series of vaccines. The scientist, I mean, I know personally because several of my colleagues were working in biology or the soft physics or some AIMS doctor, they're also working on this thing. So people have investigated or they have examined the minute intricate details of this novel coronavirus. And when, only when they have some information about that, you know, what is uh, the basic, uh, I hope you can see my uh, mouse pointer. Is it yes. Yes. yes, just so only when we have this idea about what are those infamous spike, the protein spike, which are actually you can uh, like read a lot about them in the in, in different newspapers, and what are the basic structure and how to destroy those bad things by the application of medicines or uh, some other antibodies and things like that. So only when we have information about the basic structure of this evil virus, only then it was possible for the scientist to look for a cure. So whenever we want to do something or we want to achieve something, it is very important to prove as much as possible. So basically we need to know the root and only then you can look for a cure or you can look for a better understanding. There are two important words. The question, the first thing is that I mentioned, if you go back to uh, these slides, so I mentioned in terms of a few elementary or fundamental ingredients. So now the question that I would like to discuss here, that why a few, why not a lot? Because the thing is that, suppose I give you a set of data points and I ask you to fit it using some computer program. Now, depending, of course, it depends on the data. I mean, now you know that theoretically, y is equal to mx plus c, and y is equal to ax plus bx squared plus cx cube plus dx to the power four, both are actually nothing but y is equal to a6. But in the first case, it's a linear relation, so I can actually fit this, uh, this data or whatever observation I have in terms of only two parameters. But if the observation or the pattern of the observation is really, really non-trivial or tricky, then of course I need to fit that particular data pattern with more and more parameters. So a few is not really a few. Just to give you a practical example, this is something <clears throat> that uh, you, you all know is that, I mean, I gave this to known example, which all of you have encountered during your graduate laboratories, that uh, this, uh, the famous verification of this Ohm's law, V is equal to IR, and <clears throat> the behavior of this diet. So in the first case, I know it's a linear relation and I can fit it with minimum number of parameters. 
become less of straight line in the end. But if I want to think in details, both are actually IV characteristics. But in one case, I can explain it in terms of minimal number of parameters. But in the other case, when it is about the diet, in order to understand this particular plot or this particular behavior, I need definitely more number of parameters compared to this thing. So a few is not really a few. And in fact, tomorrow we will see that this is one of the so-called drawback of the standard model. So moving further, <clears throat> another important thing that I would like to discuss is what do we mean by element? So elementary, there is actually no level of element. Why? Because elementary, the level of elementary or the concept of elementary is very much as of today. For example, if you think about this uh, 1600 years when Kepler's actually discovered or formulated uh, this uh, famous uh, laws of the planetary motion. I mean, that point of time, uh, it was good enough to explain or to understand in the planetary motion. And even after that, when people observe that there is something peculiar with the behavior of the, the orbital motion of the Mercury, even what you can do simply without going into the, the regime of the relativity and things like that, you can simply add a one by R cube term in the potential and you can actually explain this precision of the perihelion of the marker. But later, it was the Einstein and thanks to his theory of relativity, we realized that there is a better explanation of the precision of the perihelion of the Mercury, and that is because it is the closest planet to the sun. So what was elementary in 1600, it has evolved from the time when Einstein formulated his theory of relativity. I can give you one more example, which is something very much uh, relevant for today's talk. That is when Shadwick, he discovered this neutron back in 1932. That point of time, neutron was an elementary particle. But later, with improved experimental technique, so people have realized that this neutron and proton, they're not the fundamental constituents. There are substructures. And that is represented by the other diagrams on the right-hand side. So as you can see that neutron is not really a fundamental particle or an elementary particle, but there are subparticles which are nothing but the core. I will definitely introduce them and discuss more about them in details later. So this compared to 1932, as of today, Newton is no longer an elementary particle. So this concept of elementary is not something fixed it is evolving with our understanding. And I would like to finish with another example, which is something that you all know. You all have encountered uh, in your nuclear physics course about the beta decay. You know that it is nothing but the decay of a neutron, which is decaying into a proton. So I put this plus because it is positively charged, an electron and an anti-electron neutron. But later, when you have the knowledge of the quantum field theory and information about the elementary structure of neutron and the proton, you will see that I can restudy or reprobe the same decay in the context of the quantum field theory and particle physics. And this is one of the way, I mean, this is something known as the Feynman diagram, where you can reinvestigate the beta decay in the light of, of the weak interaction as we are going to see later in the context of the standard model. So elementary is always as of today. So that was the time that we spent to understand two important words, that is a few and second, the elementary. Okay, so moving on. Now the important question is that how do we define what is elementary? That is important. We have realized that elementary is something that is not fixed. Okay, but the thing is that how to define that? 
So elementary really means that it is the fundamental constituents of something. Now this something is very important. For example, if I consider a human body, so there are different level of the human body. So for example, if I see our body, it is actually the, the entire body. So it is the collection of organs. Then I can actually go into individual organ. For example, there is this digestive system. So that is the system level, which is the collection of everything. You have your liver, stomach, pancreas, this duodenum, everything. And then you go to the organ level. And finally, you go to the tissue level and you go to the cell level. Now, if you ask me that is it the fundamental thing? The answer is no, because we already know that we can. I mean, what is the basic constituent of a cell? I mean, even you can probe inside the cell. So there are things like mitochondria, there are things like DNA, RNA, nucleus, chromosome, even more fundamental things. But none of those things which I just mentioned, they're alive. So if I consider the example of a living body, it is the cell, which is the fundamental constituent. So that is really important that what is the what is the purpose of defining the fundamental block so if it is a body then of course the fundamental living block is a cell but if i consider what is the fundamental constituents of the world then of course eventually we need to discuss in terms of the electron proton not even elect, uh, not even proton and neutron electrons and quarks so in the lips of elementary things so means something which is the ultimatum as of now. Maybe with improved experimental techniques or improved uh, theoretical understanding, at some point of time, maybe we'll be able to see even finer substructure. But as of now, it's a distant dream. Also, there is something very important. Uh, and both these slides, which I have uh, just uh, uh, utilized to give you some graphical idea about what we are planning to do in the context of the standard model, these are extremely important. So first I showed you this example of that, how do we define the elementary ingredient? And the second thing is that elementary ingredients, they may differ in nature. Just to give you the, uh, uh, another practical example, once again, in the context of the, our body, we know that, I mean, as I have discussed in this slide, that the fundamental living block is nothing but a cell. But there are different types of cell. The neurons, which we have all studied in our school level biology, the structure of a neuron is completely different than a RBC, that is a red blood cell. And in a similar way, our uh, the cells which are actually there, uh, which are, uh, you know, making the, the wall of the our heart or our muscle, they're completely different. And the one who's actually responsible for the bone, it's completely weird compared to the other thing. So elementary blocks may have different appearance. It doesn't mean that if you're looking for elementary ingredients, it has to be one and only one. It is not like that. There may be a plenty of elementary ingredients as I will explain later more in the context of the particle physics. Okay, so now let us move towards today's topics, that is uh, the world of the particle physics. Now, once again, as I mentioned, that when it's come to the regime of the particle physics, the quest to look for the elementary ingredients I mean, you have to really go all the way to starting from the universe to all the level up to the basic elementary ingredients like leptons and quarks. I will definitely define them later. And what is more important, so uh, is an idea about the length scale. If you go back just two slides, and if you remember the, uh, the example that I discussed in the context of our body, so our body is something that we can see with our naked eyes. Organ, we do. Muscle, we do. But you cannot visualize a cell with your bare eyes. You need to use some sophisticated microscope. And if you want to probe even inside the scale, you need to have some 
sophisticated or advanced microscope with high resolution power. So basically, if you want to probe something which is extremely small, you need to invest or utilize greater amount of energy. And you can see that if you just take a look at the observable universe around us, and if we go all the way from universe to the quarks, you can see that there is a drastic reduction in the energy scale. So if you, for example, think about the universe, of course, I am going to confine myself in the context of the universe. I'm not going to discuss about more fancy things like multiverse, a parallel universe, only universe. Typically of the order of 10 to the power 27 to 26 meters. Now, if I start from universe and now move all the way down to earth, we know the radius is something roughly 6,400 kilometers. So it is of the order of 10 to the power 6 to 7 meters. And then I come to human body, which is of the order of meter, almost 1 to 2 meters. And from here, if I go all the way to the nucleus, we know the diameter of the nucleus is roughly of the order of 10 to the power 15 meters or so. So if we really want to probe even inside the nucleus, we need to attain a scale or we need to reach a scale which is actually smaller than say of the order of 10 to the power minus 15 meter or so. Now, in the next slide, and of course, there is a little word of caution. So that is not the ultimate smallest possible scale as of now. To our knowledge, the highest possible uh, mass is something known as the Planck's mass. And the scale corresponding to that mass, which is actually of the order of 10 to the power minus 35 meters. So that is the smallest possible scale known to us. Of course, there are physicists who are working on transplant in physics and things like that, but those are something we're not going to discuss. But as far as we consider in the context of elementary particle physics, 10 to the power minus 18 or 19 is the level which we can prove as of now. Now the important question that I would like to discuss here that we have realized that it is true that if we want to probe elementary structure, we need to move to the smaller and smaller and smaller length scale. But how it is associated with the fact that higher energy, when you think about uh, the, the human body from the body to the cell, you can understand that in terms of the resolution power of the microscope. But how we can correlate that resolution power of the microscope with the requirement of the higher energy. In order to understand that, I would like to discuss something which is very important in the context of high energy physics. And that is something that all high energy physicists love to use that is known as the natural unit system. What is natural unit system? It is just a convenient unit system where you can have better idea about, I mean, first of all, it is convenient for the calculation, but apart from creating some mere convenience, it is also utilized or useful to understand some things which is more basic or more fundamental. So, to give you this example, this h bar is nothing but the reduced Planck constant that is h by 2 pi. And you all know that the quantity has this value, I mean, the h is something 10 to the power minus 34 in SI unit. And c is the speed of light, you know, it's 10 to the power 8 meter per second. Of course, with this simply factor 3 or 2.9997, if you are very specific. If you calculate this quantity, you will get a value which is something like 0.197 GV femtometer. Femtometer is 10 to the power minus 15 meter. Now in the natural unit system, you consider H cut C to be one. And if you translate this information, that is going to give you a very interesting identity is that one femtometer is equivalent to roughly one by 200 mEV. Now that is a very, very, very important information. Why? Because 
that idea the equivalence of this length and energy is extremely useful when you are designing an experiment to probe some elementary structure because if you remember that thanks to lord rutherford that he used alpha particle to the famous gold foil experiment to probe the 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 interior structure of the nucleus and that is the the, the time when we actually discard more uh, you know older idea like this thompson's plum pudding model and things like that and we realize that the, the the actual mass is concentrated only in the nucleus and it is very 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 tiny compared to this entire thing the the electrons that is only now you can ask this question that what was the reason of rather for success the success is intricately related to the fact that he used alpha particle which typically has this energy in the ballpark of a few MeV. And if you translate this, a few MeV is nothing but of the order of 10 to the power minus 15 meter, which is the typical size of the nucleus. So no wonder if you use your probe, which is of the correct energy level, it will eventually reveal or it will, it will eventually solve the purpose. And just to give you an idea, if you actually translate the energy of the Large Hadron Collider following the same formula, which is uh, where the ultimate energy is 14 TeV, it will give you a length scale of the order of 10 to the power minus 19 meter. So now you see that apart from the discovery of Higgs particle or, or other uh, uh, new particles, uh, I mean, which could reveal the, the beyond the standard model physics or the world of the beyond the standard model physics. There is also one inherent desire that is, if you don't see any further elementary structure, still the length scale of 10 to the power minus 19 meter. And that is actually related to something that I mentioned that the concept of elementary is something as of today. So at the end of LHC's tenure, if you see no fundamental particle, that means up to the length scale of 10 to the norm minus 19 meter, our leptons and quarks, they are the most fundamental particle. But it may happen that tomorrow you, you design a, a, some future collider with greater center of mass energy, say of the order of 100 TeV or so, where the expected length scale that you can prove is 10 to the power minus 20 or minus 21 meter, which are 100 times smaller than that of the LHC, it may reveal something completely new, which is not known to us a priori. So these are the important parameters one should uh, focus while studying the world of the particle field. So now let us slowly move towards the standard model of particle physics. So <clears throat> the standard model of the particle physics, I mean, it has two types of elementary parts. One is fundamental constituents, which are elementary particles, and there are two types of elementary particles. One, Yes, some question? Hello? No, I think. Okay. So one part, fermions, and the other, bosons. Now, of course, something that you have already studied in your uh, statistical mechanics course, that the fermions are those kind of particles, which are definitely identical and intuitable, and they have, had, have integral spin, and they actually follow the fermi dirac statistics. Well, for bosons, they are, their particle natures remain the same, but they have integral spin. That means zero, one, two, it's like that. And they follow the Bose-Einstein statistics. But when we are trying to cook up a model to explain the world of particle physics, that how you know we can explain everything ar uh, happening around us, fundamental constituents is not enough. 
we also need to know how these fundamental constituents or these elementary ingredients are talking or interacting with each other. So it turns out, apart from the fundamental constituents, we also need to know about the fundamental interaction or forces. Now, as of now, there are only four fundamental interactions, namely the gravity, electromagnetic, weight, and the strong interaction. I will discuss about them in details. I have intentionally put a block uh, across the gravity because as of now, gravity is not included in the standard model of particle physics. There are certain theoretical reasons for that, which I prefer not to discuss because uh, as of now, uh, if you want to make uh, or propose a theoretical model, the way we have proposed for electromagnetic interaction, weak interaction and the strong interaction, there are certain glitches about which as of now we have no clue if we would like to apply those same techniques in the context of the gravity. So, what is the standard model in a nutshell? So, from a layman viewpoint, you can think about different elementary particles as officers or clients sitting in a big office. Now, how they can communicate with each other? If you think 100 years back, then through later, through later or through physical file transfer. But even the later and physical file transfer, so you also need some messenger like office peers to take those files from one desk or one table to the another table. So you can think about those clients or those officers as the elementary particles. The peers who are responsible for the file transfer, like you know, taking the files and information from one table to another table. So they are like the carriers of the basic or the fundamental interactions. And finally, those files which they're sharing. So by sharing these files, they're actually transmitting or interacting with each other. That those files, they are equivalent to the interaction. So if you'd like to think about the same situation in the context of a modern office, so you can think about the internet as your office peons or the fundamental carriers. Mambo. Yes. yes. Please un please mute yourself. Ah, okay. And so, so basically, sharing files means uh, sharing pictures, messages, memes, scrolls. You can think those as the kind of the the modern version of the equivalent of the elementary interactions. So this is just a viewpoint. I mean, if you would like to understand the kingdom or the basic structure of the standard model. So this is just a layman's view. Okay, so now let us first try to understand the more information or let us try to acquire more information about the fundamental forces. So as I mentioned two slides back, that there are four types of fundamental interactions strong, electromagnetic, weak, and gravity. So the interesting information which you should know about uh, this uh, interaction is that, first of all, their strength. That means uh, the way they are interacting, the intensity which we they are interacting, they're not the same. And if you are having, I mean, of course, I will explain you in more details and I will give you a better way of understanding these things. But if you are having difficulty in digesting these things, you can think about these uh, by a simple way. For example, um, uh, useful information travels slower than some meme or some trolls. So you can think of them as the kind of different platform or, or different strength of different interaction. And another important thing about the fundamental forces is that also the range over which they're interacting, they're also very much different. For example, if I think about the strong interaction, it is something which is 
strictly confined within the nucleus size. So the typical range is 10 to the power minus 15 meter or so. Whereas if I think about the electromagnetic interaction, and we know that this interaction is governed by the, 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 the so-called Coulomb's law, which is a one by R square law. So the range is actually infinite. So even if two charged particles are infinitely separated from each other, they can still interact. It may be very, very trivial, maybe very, very weak, but they will interact. It's not zero. Now, if I move towards the weak interaction, it is typically confined within the range of 10 to the power minus 18 meter or so. So that is actually something which is even smaller than the range of the strong interaction. And finally, if I come to gravity, so once again, if you remember the Newton's law, this is once again G M1 M2 by R square. So once again, this is a inverse square law. So the associated range is infinite. Now, the question is there, what are the areas or how they are interacting? So if I think about gravity, then I know anything that has a mass, it will interact by gravity. If I think about the weak interaction, this is responsible for process like beta decay, alpha decay, gamma decay, about which you have already studied in your nuclear physics course. Electromagnetic interaction, we all know, is happens between a pair of charged particles. But if they're electrically neutral, electromagnetic interaction is not there. And finally, strong interaction is something very important, which actually appears or it is responsible to bind the nucleus together. I will discuss more about it in subsequent slides. Now in the final column, I have actually discussed a little bit about the concern theory. When, it's, when you discuss about the strong interaction, it is actually mediated by a set of eight particles, which are known as gluons. So they are massless. They have one unit of speed, which is same that of the photon, which is also massless. However, if I discuss about the weak interaction, then the mediators, which are responsible to carry the information about the weak interaction, they are not massless, they are massive. And their masses are uh, rather high, which is of the order of 80 G. Now there is a little, uh, and, but they're also still one particle. So there is a little bit of warning as I mentioned in the, in the beginning that in the context of the particle physics, we prefer to use this natural unit system. And in the natural unit system, apart from H cut C is equal to one, we also consider C is equal to one. That is the speed of light is equivalent to one. So if you actually have this kind of uh, unit system in your mind, then you know that the unit of the mass is no longer GV by C square, but it is simply GV. Typically from this relation E is equal to MC square, I would expect that the unit of the mass should be some energy scale by C square. But in the natural unit system, as C is equal to one, so for a particle physicist, all masses are expressed in energy unit. So that is the reason I mentioned W plus, W minus, and Z naught, which are the mediators of the weak interaction, they have masses of the order of 100 G. And finally, when we discuss about the gravity, there is a hypothetical particle known as the graviton, which is like the gluons, the photons, or the W and the Z bosons. So they are basically the mediators by which, uh, by which two massive objects are interacting each other through the gravitational interaction. I mean, theoretically, it has also zero mass and the spin too. But as of now, we have no experimental evidence of graviton. So I would prefer not to discuss about them further in this talk. So moving on, now let us try to understand that when you mention about the strong and the weak, how do we quantify them? 
because in physics you always need to quantify something in the physics you cannot just say that this is big and this is small you have to define which is big which is small for example a normal human is smaller than an elephant but a smaller uh, but a normal human is way larger than a rat or than uh, some some rabbit so information about the proper length scale or the proper energy scale is very important in the context of the particle scale so just to give you an illustrative example here i have calculated the electromagnetic repulsive force between a pair of electron and the gravitational attractive force between a pair of electron so i have calculated in si unit and i haven't used any specific value of r so because both are inverse square laws so eventually if i compare or, or take ratio of these things so this r square information will go away so you can clearly see that the exorbitant or abnormal small ness of the gravitational interaction compared to the electromagnetic interaction so you can see clearly why if you consider uh, that uh, whether the gravitational elect uh, the gravitational interaction can keep a pair of electron together it's wrong it is true that there exists electromagnetic repulsion and you have also gravitational interaction but the attractive the magnitude of the attractive agent is way 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 smaller than that of the repulsing agent so of course the repulsion will win and in fact if you repeat the same exercise by replacing one of the electron with proton and if you try to work out with r of the order of 10 to the power minus 10 meter that is the typical fast uh, the size of the fast bohr radius then it will explicitly show you that this ratio comes out to be of the order of 10 to the power minus 39 as i have showed here and this 1 by 137 is something that you can immediately realize because that is nothing but the value of the fine structure constant which is alpha is equal to e square by 4 pi now if this part is clear to you i would like to give you now some idea about how strong really is our strong force in order to understand that i have recalculated same two quantity but this time in the context of a proton and now you see that if i use the typical size of a nucleus which is of the order of 10 to the power minus 15 meter i see or i can realize that the magnitude of the coulomb repulsion between two proton is way higher than the gravitational attraction between two proton that is fine but that immediately gives us this idea that how strong the strong force indeed because in spite of these huge amount of coulomb repulsion if you consider heavy nucleus you have more than one proton which are you know squeezed or packed inside this tiny nucleus and they are staying together so that simply means that there must be a new kind of interaction which is way 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 powerful than the coulomb repulsion to keep them together and clearly gravitational attraction is not that one so you need a different mechanism so that not only gives you a motivation of having a strong interaction that also gives you this idea that why it is indeed a strong force because it is holding equally charged particle together inside a very 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 tiny volume 
which is of the order of 10 to the power minus 15 meter or so. Okay, so now before moving further, I would like to discuss some funny things about this elementary force carrier. So once again, as advised by the organizer, I prefer not to use any equation or not to give you any group theoretic argument or the underlying group theoretic structure, but I would just like to give you some uh, elementary idea to understand what is going on. So the fact that we have in our hand is that gluons, which are the mediators for the strong interaction and photons, which are the mediator for the electromagnetic interaction, both are massless. And normally, if it's a massless mediator, then I would expect that the, the corresponding interaction range must be infinite because it is massless. It can go all the way through. Nothing is going to stop it. But it turns out that photons are massless and the electromagnetic interaction, it indeed extends up to infinity. But the gluons, they're massless. But as you have seen in this slide, that the range of the strong interaction is only 10 to the power minus 15 meter. Now that is a contradiction. A massless particle, which is photon, it and the corresponding interaction extends all the way up to infinity. Another massless particle, gluon, and the corresponding interaction is short range. So how to digest that? without going into the detail of the underlying theory. If you have good knowledge about the group theory, you can clearly explain this, I mean, with mathematical proof, but I would like to give an alternate viewpoint of this, uh, I mean, of this fact that why, in spite of being massless, gluons cannot move all the way up to infinity. So basically what is actually happening here, so first if I think about the photon, so they are really alone. So even if two photon, if the C's is us other, they're not going to interact because they have nothing common to share. So if two of you have a chance to meet and you have no common point of attraction or interest, then of course you are not going to talk with this other guy. And that is exactly what is true for the photon. So in between two photons, there is nothing common. They have no information to trade off. So a photon cannot talk to itself and there is no such thing like three photon or four photon interaction. And because it cannot fill the presence of other photon, so it can go all the way up to infinity. And that is a consequence of this fact that electromagnetic interaction is of infinite extension. Now, if I try to think about the same situation in the context of the gluons, I see there is a new thing. The gluons, they actually have something which they can trade off with other gluons. Fine. And immediately when you have something to trade off with your friends, you will start interacting. So there are things like three gluon interaction and four gluon interaction. And basically, in the presence of this interaction, a gluon cannot move all the way up to infinity. So in spite of being massless, unlike photon, the range of the strong interaction is really, really small. It is not infinitely extended. Of course, if you want to probe it in, 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 in a proper way, then you have to understand the concept of the color charge and non-abelian interaction and things like that. But as I said, but I would like to give you a simple picture. The simple picture is that photons, they have nothing to trade off. So one photon is never talking to another photon. And that's why they can move uninterrupted. 
on the contrary gluons they have something to trade off so they can interact with other gluons and the moment they start interacting so there is like no free movement so they keep on interacting with more and more and more gluons so eventually that will force the strong interaction to be confined in a very tiny region if i try to apply the same things in the context of the weak bosons which are the uh, the mediator for the weak interaction namely the w plus the w minus and the z they have actually two reasons we know first of all that the weak interaction is also a finite range but the reason here twofold first they have something to trade off just like the gluon so basically there will be three weak bosons and four weak bosons interaction and on top of that they are massive so as a consequence of this two information they cannot move to a great distance and this are the reason why weak interaction is also confined or constrained to be a short range interaction so before i move further if there is any questions that uh, i would like to discuss otherwise uh, other will i will move on and i will take questions in that at the end sir yes please uh, sir when you have discussed the uh, energy scales uh, on the previous slides mm -hmm. sir, there you have considered that at certain stages there are different energies i want to know that it is it only happens you can say like that only if you consider the universe for example as a closed system so is it uh, is it the fact that we used to see the all the uh, energy scales as the as the closed system see there i am not associating something with something what i am saying that if i want to probe a small distance or any amount of distance there is a energy scale associated with that so for example if i want to probe a distance which is say of the order of 10 to the power minus 20 meter or minus 21 meter then i must try to develop some mechanism which can give me something around 100 tv or 200 tv of energy so only when i am working uh, in that energy threshold only then i have a hope to explore something as small as 10 to the power minus 21 meter is it clear okay sir i'm not i'm not talking about open system or closed system i'm just actually saying that if you go to the natural unit system it gives you some idea i mean it gives you some equivalence between the length scale and the energy scale i mean in the same way you can actually have a equivalence between the energy scale and the time scale so these are useful when you actually when you would like to for example uh, say you would like to design some collider that is important okay so moving on now we are again back to the kingdom sir. yes hello sir yes yes sir uh, in general relativity uh, they say that space time curvature causes gravity but here you said that uh, gravitons causes gravity so sir can you explain which one is correct or the aspect of thinking is just the reason uh, sorry so you you voice was not very very clear so in the in the gr in the general theory of relativity uh, they say that space time curvature causes the gravity the gravitational force but here in okay, quantum okay but the thing is that i mean as of now so the thing is that i am not actually interested in discussing anything about the gr so i mean what i am actually saying that if you believe that gravity is also an, uh, i mean it is true that gravity is also another elementary interaction and if you would like to have an equivalent picture like all the remaining fundamental interaction then there exists a hypothetical particle called graviton which is responsible for this interaction
okay so moving on so now when we go to the kingdom of the elementary particles as i mentioned so in terms of the elementary ingredients there are two type of ingredients as i already mentioned elementary fermions and elementary bosons now out of elementary fermions there are two kinds of elementary fermions leptons and quarks both are spin half particles but when we go to the regime of the elementary bosons there are two kind of elementary bosons one scalar bosons which are spin zero and vector bosons which are spin one so typically these vector bosons are the bosons which are actually responsible for mediating the elementary interaction for example the photons the gluons and the w and the v bosons all of them are examples of the vector bosons and the spin zero boson there is only one spin zero boson and the standard model and that is nothing but higgs so i will discuss about this in later but before that what you can see that when i discuss about the elementary bosons you can see that if it is scalar it has a spin zero if it is spin one then i'm going to call them vector bosons but in spite of being spin half object how do i differentiate between a leptons and the quarks so what are the reasons why we have differentary element different elementary particles when i can see that they have the same spin so the question that i would like to ask here that how do we group different elementary particles of course if you have knowledge about the group theory then you, it is rather easy to understand but as i mentioned that i want i don't want to go into the details of the group theory so what i will do i will try to present an alternative and rather layman's way of understanding that how we can group different elementary particles to continue that or to move in this direction just consider collection of several english alphabet now you just need to consider two kind of reflection one is the vertical reflection and one is the horizontal reflection so if you consider two different kind of reflection then you see that alphabets i h o x this four you can also do a kind of mental exercise or you can verify this with the with, with the piece of pen and paper you can see that i h o and x these are the out of this chosen set so these are the four alphabets which are invariant under both vertical and horizontal reflection but instead of this four if i consider a and m i see they are actually invariant only under the vertical reflection in an analogous way if i think about k b and e they are invariant only under the horizontal reflection and there are also candidates like n and l which are actually invariant under no, uh, neither under the vertical reflection nor under the horizontal reflection so you can see here even just playing with some known example of english alphabets we can see how the trivial example of vertical reflection and horizontal reflection can group different alphabets differently just to move a little bit more in this direction now what i can do let us define v plus and h plus to denote invariance under a particular reflection so i am going to use v plus if i would like to denote invariance under the vertical reflection and h plus if i want to uh, denote invariance under the horizontal reflection and if they are not invariant then i would like to represent them by v minus and h minus accordingly so i can see now i can define a set of two numbers to level each of this english alphabet so i h v i h o and a then i can define as v plus and h plus whereas for a and a i can level them as v plus h minus for k b e i should define them as v minus h plus and same for n so now you can see 
that without going into the details of uh, group theory and things like that, just by picking up a set of English alphabets and just by using this simple vertical and horizontal reflection, how I can club up or group different English alphabets differently. So those who have some idea about the group theory or uh, uh, advanced topics like that. So these are nothing but the associated charges against a particular group. But as I mentioned that I don't want to go into that details, but by applying this simple logic, I can show that how different alphabets, they behave differently under two reflection. So here basically this V plus H plus or V minus H minus this four number, I can use different combination of these four numbers to identify the state of a particular English alphabet. So similarly, when you would like to discuss the example of the particle physics, so there are certain properties which are the same for a group of the particle and that is the reason why we call them as the lepton. And for the quark, you will see another set of properties or some numbers which are analogous to this V plus H plus V minus H minus. So these numbers, they are different for leptons and quarks. So the way I have here differentiated A M and K B E by the similar logic of course, with more rigorous mathematical structure, you can see that leptons are clubbed together and this other elementary particles, which are known as the quarks, they are also clubbed together. So they are completely different in the context of the particle physics. So <coughs> now, <coughs> if I consider the first group that are the leptons, so you can see, first of all, these things are appearing family-wise or generation-wise. So there are there exist actually six leptons. So three of them, which are the neutrinos, they are electrically neutral. And if you consider the pure standard model, as was proposed by Weinberg, Salam, and Glasho, in that model, neutrinos are exactly massless. But now we know that neutrinos they have tiny masses, but that is something that I would like to discuss in the next lecture. Now, if I consider the bottom half, that is, this is electron, this is muon, and this is tau. So these are again leptons, but they are electrically charged, and all of them, they have minus one unit of charge. Now, you can see that this leptons, they actually appear family-wise. This electron, neutrino, and the electron, they are the part of one family. Typically, this is known as the first family of the first generation. In an analogous way, I can define another set with muon neutrino and muon, and finally with tau neutrino and tau. And another interesting thing is that, that if I move from electron to tau, the mass is actually increasing. And the reason why we can club them together, that is, I can put this muon neutrino and electron in a bracket. Similarly, muon neutrino and muon in a bracket, and finally tau neutrino and tau in the bracket, because they have some same set of quantum numbers or some same set of charge in a layman's way, which actually help me to club them together. Exactly the way I actually presented. Uh, the previous example in the context of English alphabets. And these are something, so, and these properties are something extremely important because since most of you are doing your graduation, you know that based on these properties, you know certain decays are allowed and certain processes or decays are not allowed. For example, what I can do I can actually associate something which is known as the lepton number because all of them are leptons. But I can also define family-wise lepton number. 
for example for the first family i can define electron lepton number for the second family i can define a muon lepton number and the, for the third family i can define a tau lepton number now let me give you a decay where a muon is decaying into an electron a uh, anti electron neutrino and a muon neutrino so this decay is absolutely possible because what you can see that on one side i have a muon so muon lepton number is 1 and on the other side i have a muon neutrino so which is also having the muon lepton number 1 so muon lepton number is there balanced now here i also have one electron which has a electron num lepton number plus 1 unit so in that equation if i would like to have a valid equation which respects total and family wise lepton number i must put a anti electron neutrino because that is the thing that is going to give me a lepton number minus 1 so that the overall electron lepton number remain constant i cannot use a neutrino i must use a electron type anti neutrino but never a electron type neutrino so this information this this set of information that how we are actually clubbing them together it is useful to study their properties and the way they participated in different interaction and also unless you don't know what are those corresponding numbers to club them together you cannot write a valid interaction or a valid interaction term involving this particle so this is what you eventually learn when you have good not i mean when you typically learn in the masters when you know about the quantum field theory and the gauge field theory and you eventually know that how to write down a a valid interaction term in the context of the standard model of particle physics exactly in this way what i can do i can define the other set of elementary particle which are nothing but the quarks so just like the lepton families here also we can see three families so the first family it contains up quark down quark they are clubbed together because they have something common the other family they have charm quark and strange quark they are clubbed together because they are same and also in the similar way i can club the top quark and the bottom quark and this is actually the third family now there is something which is again interesting and something which is exactly the same as of the lepton case you can see from the first generation to the third generation the mass is actually increasing similarly here you can also see that this is the direction of the increasing mass so compared to the first generation second generation is heavy and third generation is even heavier but there is something which is really really interesting or different compared to the way we have grouped the lepton together you take a look at all this <coughs> family you see neutrinos are lying on top which are practically massless and the massive one is actually lying at the bottom but if i go to the quark sector it's the typically the other way around especially if you consider the second and the third generation the top quark is way more heavier than the bottom quark and the charm quark is also about 10 times heavier than the strange quark so these are the the different way of assigning different charges or how you are clubbed together but this pattern is completely different from the way of the lepton family also there is something which is really interesting unlike the lepton family where you have one neutral and one charge object in each generation or in each family here both the members of one family contains electrical charge but they are fractional all the up members u c and t they carry an electrical charge of plus 2/3 times e where e is the unit of the electric charge the elementary charge in the nature whereas the bottom part they actually carry an electric charge which is minus 1/3 of e that is true for dsb apart from the electric charge they also carry another additional charge which is known as the color charge 
if you have difficulty in understanding these things, you just go back to this slide and you see that basically I can define, here I have the way I have defined individual English alphabets under consideration by a set of two numbers. If you consider more complex operation, you will have more numbers. So basically each operation is going to give you one set of numbers. Surprisingly, for leptons, there exists nothing like Kara. But for the quark, apart from the electrical charge, which is fractional in nature, you also have an additional number or an additional label to, 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 to represent them. It's known as the color. And we are going to see that why it is important. But there is something drastically different from the leptons and the quark. We can see free leptons in nature. I can see an electron. Whereas I can't see a free quark in nature. So the question is that, why is that? Of course, <coughs> there are, I mean, if you know advanced topics, you can explain it rather easily. But once again, I would like to explain this in the in terms of the simple logic or in layman's language. So first of all, let us see that why fractional charges. In order to understand that, First of all, thanks to this Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, SLAC, where we have discovered this phenomena. The important thing is that the moment we have discovered substructure of proton and neutron, we have realized that there are three of them. Now, if there are three of them and there are methods for experiment to have information or to access the electrical charges. Now, it turns out that the electrical charges are fractional. But the beauty of this thing is that when you combine all these three, the overall charge must be an integer. So for the proton, you have quark structure like UUD. Now for the up quark, the electrical charge is plus two third of E. And for the down quark, it is minus one third of E. Add them together, you will get plus one, which we know is the electrical charge for the proton. Similarly, when you add neutron, the combination is UDD, you add them together, you will get zero. And we know in nature, electron is electrically neutral. And there is also something which is really interesting, that the quarks, they have some color leveling. But in nature, neither proton nor neutron, they are colored objects. This is, once again, the reason of the underlying theory, but we would like to understand this from a different viewpoint. So now I would like to discuss a little bit that why do we need the color quantum number or the color leveling? This is something that all of you have studied in the context of your nuclear physics. This is the famous <coughs> decouplet. Now you see two interesting candidates one with zero strangeness, doubly electrically charged. So the quark composition is U, U, U. And similarly, you can also consider the sigma that is uh, S, S, S. Now the interesting thing is that now you have three elementary fermions which are staying together. Now that is clearly a problem of the exclusion principle because, and we also know one more thing that they are spin half object. So if I have U and U, I can save the day by assigning spin up for one U and spin down for another U. But how to proceed with the third one? They are spin half object. If I have spin one object, then I can consider, okay, one up plus one minus one and zero, no problem but they are spin half, so either plus half or minus half. So how to place the third one? If I consider the third one down, two of them will have all quantum numbers the same. If I consider plus half, again the same. So it turns out that having three identical quark for delta plus plus and sigma, it is 
challenging or it is a contradiction of the exclusion principle. So of course, people read many web theories like parafermi static scene and things like that. But the easiest example was, thanks to the people who proposed it, that why don't we think about some new numbers? Maybe there exists some new level which allow you to put three u together. So that means even if you consider two u we spin down or two u we spin up, there is some additional number which are different in between these two ups and similarly in between this two of these strings. So that actually saves the day and that was the motivation of proposing a new label known as the color. But it turns out that in nature, this number is actually conserved. So in nature, we see everything that are color neutral. And that is one of the reasons why we can't see free quark in nature. But apart from that, there is one more reason as I'm going to explain in the next slide. That is, besides color, electrical charges are also quantized in nature. So in nature, you are never going to get object with plus two third E or fractional electric charges. And this idea of this quantization is not difficult to understand because you have already studied. I mean, here I just wanted to give you a simple example. I mean, you all know this thermal particle in a box problem. This is a asymmetric box, one dimensional box from zero to L. Inside that potential is zero and outside infinity and the box length is zero to L. So you can actually calculate the innate energy level and you know that unlike the classical physics, I have specific values of N, one, two, three, N is equal to zero is not allowed because then the wave function will trivially vanish. So there are fixed level of the energy. So as if the energy is quantized. Similarly, there exist mathematical methods or ways to prove that the electrical charges are also quantized in nature. So you can have object to zero, one, two, three, four, minus one, minus two, but not the fractional charge. That is also one more reason why you don't see a free quark moving in the nature. Now, I would just, since it's a kind of, uh, uh, it's a kind of uh, elementary lecture or to understand particle physics in layman's language. So let me ask you all one question. That <coughs> why we can't have a tetra quark state like Q, 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 Q. Why? Anyone? Because you see the motivation of discovering the fact that there actually exist three colors which are typically known as rgb because we were trying to save the day or we were trying to save the exclusion principle in the context of a particle which has three quarks uuu or sss or ddd whatever but my question is that why don't we can try to i mean why don't we see something like q q q q of course then we are going to have I mean, then probably this three color hypothesis is not correct and you need to have four colors and you can try to i mean think about it you don't need to answer immediately and you can try to think about the same in the context of a pentaquark with q q q q q of course tetra quark is something that people have discovered but they have their basic square compositions are like Q, 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 Q bar, or Q bar, Q bar, Q, Q. And there, of course, because it is Q and Q bar, they are different. So we don't have any problem with the exclusion principle or with the color statistic. But my question is that what's wrong with Q, 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 Q? Because then you need to have four basic colors and not the three elementary colors. Think about it. You don't need to answer. Maybe we can discuss about this uh, during the next lecture. <coughs> so moving on. Now, the most important thing is that, so we have basically discussed 
the elementary ingredients of the standard model and we have also realized certain peculiarity for example the finite range of gluons compared to the infinite range of the photons when both of them are massless we have also realized that why weak interaction is finite range and we have also realized that how we can club certain particles as lepton and certain other elementary particles as quarks and why the uh, quarks are carrying fractional charges and they have an additional label on them in terms of the color quantum number now the final thing that we need to understand is the most important part of the standard model that is the context of the higgs so as i mentioned once again that apart from these elementary particles spin half particles so there are also bosons so spin one bosons as i already mentioned like they are the force mediator and i have already introduced them but there is also a spin zero boson the mysterious mr higgs and as far our understanding that this is the reason why most of the standard model particles are massive as we have observed experimentally except a few guy for example like photon and the gluon which is denoted as z and the neutrinos as of the original standard model proposed by van der gelam glasso and so on now it turns out that the mass term for these particles are actually forbidden by the symmetry argument it seems very weird that how one art a mass term is forbidden by the symmetry argument now typically in the context of the field theory when you are going to learn it a mass term is always bilinear for example x square y square if x is going to represent say photon or a, um, or w boson and z boson things like that it's always bilinear but as per this slide that is forbidden by the symmetry argument it apparently seems a bit confusing but let us try to prove it in detail so in order to prove that let me give you a very simple example which all of you have either worked out or you can work out it very easily so consider a simple schrodinger equation so i can write down h i is equal to p square to n psi and h i is the time independent part of the schrodinger equation but now consider i want to do a transformation under psi which is given as psi prime is equal to psi sin which is our alpha s alpha is a constant but i am considering a one dimensional system for simplicity but this alpha is not a pure constant it is something which is a function of the coordinate if you put this thing you will realize that i need a new vector to keep this theory invariant and when this wave function has a transformation like this i mean you have to work it out the corresponding vector must undergo a transformation like this so this alpha prime actually denotes the first derivative of alpha so i just use the conventional language it is required to keep the corresponding theory in very if you do that you will see that you cannot have a term which is bilinear in a dot a or a square because that is going to violate this i mean that is not going to remain invariant under this transformation so that is one simple way of understanding that how a quadratic term in certain field may appear forbidden from the symmetry argument a note of question here you have to do it in this way if you just blindfoldly replace this minimal substitution that is p by p minus c a mod square then of course you are going to get this a square and you know if you use certain choice of a then you can actually get those diamagnetic terms which has this p square kind of dependence but no i'm not doing this minimal substitution what i'm doing i'm actually claiming a particular transformation of the wave function and in order to keep then the schrodinger equation invariant i must introduce a vector in the theory 
which also has the following transformation. And of course, if you would like to work it out, you have to use this condition, which I'm sure that you have used in the context of this, <coughs> the, the Coulomb gauge. So indeed, so this is a very schematic way of understanding or to digest the fact that how a particular symmetry argument can forbid a bilinear term. It turns out that the symmetry associated with the lepton, with the quarks, and the and, and and then with the standard model, they actually forbid any kind of bilinear term. So theoretically, everything should appear massless. But experimentally, we know that, for example, as I mentioned in one of the preliminary slides, the WZ. I mean, they have a masses of the order of 100 G. So the question is that if they are having some masses of the order of 100 G, then how on earth they're getting their mass? Because I know a term which is going to represent, uh, going to represent the mass term of the W boson, it must be like a quadratic term. So something like A dot A, like A vector dot A vector. But such terms are forbidden by symmetry argument. So there must be some ways to elevate this hindrance and to assure the presence of massive particles in the context of standard model. Now, before discussing that, there is also another thing or important thing that is also very important to understand that it is true that the problem of the mass generation of the standard model particles is through the Higgs mechanism. But indeed there exists an exorbitant amount of hierarchy in the particle masses for example gluons and photons are the massless in the original standard model the neutrinos are massless but even in the modified theory where we know that the neutrinos are massive their mass is very tiny of the order of 0 0.01 electron volt or so but then if you move from all the way from electron to top quark you see a drastic jump the mass of the electron, as you all know, it's 500, it, it's half MeV, so 511 keV. But if I go to top four, the mass is 175 GeV of that order. So there is a huge hierarchy. Now the question is that how to understand that hierarchy? Of course, there are complicated theoretical formulation to digest that, but as of now, there is no ultimate way to understand that why there is a huge hierarchy in mass. But you can try to understand in this way that it is actually how an individual particle is interacting with the Higgs. Just to give you this idea, just think about a old tar peak. So if you need to move from site A to site B, you need to move through the tar. And of course, if you have an animal which is lighter weight, there is a chance that it can actually survive all the way through. But if you consider a dinosaur or a feather to tiger, then, I mean, it is rather expected that they will sink in the midway because the way they are interacting with the tar pit, it depends on their body mass. So exactly if a particular standard model particle, it has a greater coupling or the way it couples with the Higgs particle is large compared to other particles, then of course that particular particle is going to have larger masses compared to the other particles. So if I go back one slide and if I now try to understand the way electron and top quark, they are coupling with the Higgs, it is clear that the coupling between the top and Higgs is way, way, way larger compared to the way an electron is coupled to the Higgs. And this coupling are known as the Yukawa couplings, but I'm not going to write down any interaction in details. And in the same picture, you can think about like the gluon, photons, and the neutrinos as of the original standard model, like the parts, because they can move all the way from here to here. So they are actually the kind of particle which has no direct interaction with the Higgs. And that is one of the reasons why they remain massless. They may have interaction, 
with his but indirect no direct because of the absence of the direct interaction with the higgs gluon photons and the neutrinos as of the original standard model they remain massless <clears throat> so now i give you the complete picture of the standard model and you can see that <coughs> these are the quark blocks <coughs> these are the lepton blocks and as i mentioned so you have this neutrino and the charge lepton identical copy of three blocks one is the electron block second is the muon block and the tau block and then you have this first family of quarks with up down second family charm strength and the third top and bottom and you can see that the drastic increase in the mass over the generation and in fact even within each family there is a huge mass hierarchy in the first generation is it minimal i mean the mass of the eu is something like 2.2 ev mev whereas the mass of the d is of the order of 5 so it's just like double but if i go to the charm and strength it's 1.28 gev and it is actually of the order of 100 mev so it's roughly 10 times but if i come here it is 173 and it is 4 so 40 times and the same logic holds true if you consider the lepton family it is true that the neutrinos are of very i mean if you consider the pure standard model the original standard model is massive but even if you consider the modified i mean as the standard model as of now i mean the mass as i mentioned of the neutrino is typically of the order of 0.01 electron volt that is way, way smaller than 511 keV. So, indeed, there is a huge mass hierarchy between each generation and across the generation. And finally, with these orange blocks, I have represented this different force mediator, gluon for the strong interaction, photon, and W and the Z. And as you can see, as I mentioned in one of the slides, the Z is slightly heavier than the W. But they have masses in the ballpark of 100 GV. And finally, we have Mr. Higgs, which is the final missing piece of the standard model. And the current rough order of magnitude of the Higgs mass is of the order of 125 GV. So you can see that the way the torque is coupled to Higgs is really maximal because it is actually getting its masses through Higgs, and the mass is actually heavier than the Higgs mass itself. So, which is surprising. And <clears throat> this is a slide where I would like to discuss that who's who at the particle physics group. So, I have already introduced you with this elementary interaction, but the schematic interactions of the standard model particles can be represented here through a simple cartoon. So, as you can see, that this leptons, that is the neutral leptons and the charged lepton, they're interacting with the photon. They're interacting with the Higgs boson and they're also interacting with the, the quick boson, that is the W and Z. But as I mentioned, when I was defining this grouping of the particle, that leptons are the particles which are without any color leveling. So that is the reason you see that leptons, they are not talking with the gluon because gluon is something which is talking either to itself. So that is the reason of this four and three handshake. That means gluon can interact with each and it can interact also with the quark. But the quark, as you can see, they have both legs. They have electrical legs and the color legs. So they can not only interact to photon, they can also interact with the gluons and they can also interact with the quick water. And you can see, whereas if I consider photon, it can interact with weak bosons, it can interact with quark, it can interact with leptons, but you see, because photon is massless, there is no direct interaction between photon to Higgs. Similarly, gluon being massless, you can see there is no direct interaction between gluon to Higgs. So this entire cartoon is a schematic representation of all the basic interaction of the standard model. Now, I would like to know from the organizer that since it is almost one, so should I continue or should I stop here for today? Hello. <coughs> Joydeep. Uh, because maybe I can just take a few questions. Hmm. <coughs> Joydeep, are you here?
So, Pradeep, so let's have the question answer session today and you continue yes. from next day. Okay. In okay. the chat section, you can find questions. Uh, can you okay. see the chat section? Let me see. So, first, I think I should stop sharing. Okay. Pipira, you can you can see the chat box. Yes, yes, yes. So one question I can see matter is anything that has mass and volume. So why do space uh, rather dark matter don't get hot by the radiation of sun? So this is a question which I would like to discuss in the next class when I'm going to discuss more about the dark matter. Because the thing is that as of now, I still need to mention a few more things about the standard model. But uh, why do space rather dark matter? I mean, how or not the space can get heated? What do you have in empty space? <laughs> and then you say another question, why Planck length, Planck mass, and Planck time are the smallest possible value of the length, mass, and time? Why? We... So as I said, that there are people who are working on the transplankian physics, but there are different motivation for that. See, as of now, one of the motivation is that, I and mean, of course, I'm not the best person to talk about this, since the people who are doing their research on the string, so they believe that these are the kind of uh, the, the, the most fundamental constituents of nature. And uh, I mean, the way we are seeing particle, they're actually just some modes of those strings. So they are actually, the, the plan scale is the limit. So, and also in order to explain this thing, Probably I need to use something that's a bit hard for you to understand. I mean, then I have to use some terms like some evolution of the normalization group. But okay, just to give you a kind of layman's view. So basically, the one is that you see in the high energy physics, their values are not fixed. For example, this value of, just to give you a very uh, uh, ready example, you, you see that. Uh, <coughs> that uh, mm, alpha, the fine structure constant, it is actually something of the order of one by 137. But this value of one by 137 is not fixed. It is actually a certain limit. I am not going to mention explicitly about the limit. In some other limit, for example, if I want to apply the value of alpha, say at the context of the LHC, then I have to use the value of alpha, which is actually of that, I mean, where the energy is of that order. And it is actually of the order of one by 128. So any fundamental quantity, they're actually in, in elementary particle physics, you know, their values keep on changing with the, with the energy scale. So if you, um, uh, consider SM couplings in this way, then something peculiar you would actually expect if you go beyond the Planck scale. So those are something that are not well appreciated and those are one of the reasons that why we prefer to don't go below. But there are literatures and work where <coughs> when you can actually think about that. So then there is any reference you'd like to suggest that would be at all with these things. So, okay, first of all, so these are the, I mean, this over simplification is partly from my experience. I mean, if you really want to learn about the basic of the standard model, so there are a few very standard literature. For example, there is a, a, one a book by uh, Halzen and Martin, and there is uh, another uh, book, Introduction to Elementary Particles by David J. Griffith. So these are two standard textbooks which you can follow. But once again, the problem is that in order to understand that, I mean, you need to know certain uh, additional things. For example, as of now, you have some familiarity with the Lagrangian. 
but the moment we uh, we go to uh, understand this 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 mathematical structure of the standard model and such things so first thing what you need to know we need to learn about the field theory <clears throat> so you have to so in the context of the the schrodinger equation you are using chi as a wave function but uh, and uh, probably you, you have also seen the the dirac equation in the context of the wave function but the problem is that <clears throat> if you believe this one particle uh, uh, representation and then if you would like to explain things like the negative energy and uh, the concept of the dirac c i'm not going into details because uh, this is not the correct way so there you are going to see that uh, the dirac c actually requires that it's a c which is uh, completely free so it is uh, it is something not coherent with the one particle uh, idea of this quantum mechanics so you need to go to the qft that is the quantum field theory so once you have good knowledge about the quantum field theory and the gauge field theory so those charges i mean how you actually label different particles these are based on different gauge group how they are actually organized uh, i mean and because of those gauge groups you have uh, the the leptons and the quarks in different ways for example <clears throat> if you are interested the, the the actual gauge group structure of the standard model is su3 of c so it is a special unitary group 3 of the color times su2l it's a special unitary group of 2 and another is that u1 of hypercharge so this is the complete uh, gauge group structure of the standard model you can think about this three things as three levels and all the standard model particles they have some so they have a set of three numbers which actually represent how they are behaving under this difference level for example as i mentioned that the the, the leptons they do not have any color but as you can see that in the standard model the quarks they are carrying color so if i would like to write down a complete theory of the standard model i must also assign some color for the lepton now how to do that this is something that we have all studied something which has no connection with a particular operation i can just assign a trivial charge for that particular quantity against that particular operation so leptons are actually color singlet so you can think in this way so they have no color so by doing this i am actually you know putting also the leptons and the quarks in a in in the in the same frame or in the same footmark from the viewpoint of the mathematical structure of the standard model i can give you one more example which is uh, rather uh, easy for you to understand so i am sure that some of you have studied this uh, so you have studied this uh, j is equal to l plus s that is the <clears throat> total orbital and uh, the total angular momentum is the collection of the orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum now l is something orbital angular momentum you know it has a special existence you can write down l is equal to r cross p but spin when we go to the to the to the quantum mechanics spin is something i mean you have studied this uh, stern galag experiment spin is something it's a intrinsic property it has no uh, like uh, space time thing but then how on earth you are actually adding l plus s it is just like you know adding one brinjal with one pomegranate it's impossible so what you are actually doing you are actually thinking that when you are adding l plus a this l is not really the pure a it is actually a l which is expressed in a bigger platform where it have a non trivial structure in the position space x y z but it has a trivial structure in the spin space which is the identity that means identity remains anything invariant similarly when you are considering the spin you are considering that it has a non trivial uh, structure in the in the spin space but in the position space it has a identity structure and now if i expand this in this way 
then I have no problem in adding L plus S because now I have elevated them from where they belong to a new platform where they have a non-trivial space where they are actually ruling and they have a trivial existence in the other space. So in the same language, if you think that if I want to put a theory where quarks and leftovers are treated in a, in, a, in a equal way, then I must put some trivial uh, assignments against this color concept for the left ones, because otherwise I can merge them together. So in this way, you can actually define quarks, you can define charges for <coughs> leptons and, and everything. In fact, the entire theory of the standard model is actually a play of the group theory. I mean, for example, since one of the question is something like, you can think about this thing, for example, gluons, the mediators of the, the strong interaction. There are eight gluons. The question is why? There are eight because if you have an SUN group, so the corresponding number of mediators should be n square minus one. So in the context of the standard model, for the color, it is SU3. So three square minus one is eight, and that is what you have eight gluons. And the same is also true for the weak sector. It is guided by SU2, so it is two. So two square is four minus one, three, and that is why you have three weak bosons. <coughs> okay if you have uh, any uh, uh, more questions you can uh, you can ask so there are one more question so i'm just going to <coughs> because i'm having a throat problem so there, there been a you know, just one minute no, no, let, let me just take a screenshot of this question. So there is one more question, <coughs> which I will discuss. <coughs> yeah, thank you. <coughs> yeah, there is one question, <coughs> which is for the electron double slit experiment. I will discuss it, but either, I mean, we can come back after a five minutes break or I can discuss it tomorrow. Maybe, maybe uh, I think uh, maybe in the ne next day at the question and answer session, uh, we can we can uh, take up uh, those questions. If you have taken a screenshot, then obviously those questions will be with you, and uh, we can we can uh, continue yeah. discussing uh, those questions uh, maybe after the lecture after the uh, next Saturday's lecture. Because I think there will be more questions, so you can you can yes, uh, take up these one questions one. along with the other set of questions. So mm -hmm. I think it may be uh, easier okay, for so you just, then uh, to discuss thing, this. Uh, just one thing, so sir, the unstable quadruplet that you asked would have isospin of three by two and strangers from my Then the brain machine resolution appears to be satisfied. Level. How do you explain the instability of quadruplet? And it is elaborate on this unstable nature. This is a question that I would answer quickly for the electron double slit and the wave nature of these things. I will discuss. I need to discuss more. So I didn't mention about the quadruplet. I mentioned about that why you can't have a tetra quark. That is a collection of four quarks. But Q, 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 Q. And I asked this mm -hmm. intentionally because, you know, we already, because just few, I think few months back in 2021, there was an LHC discovery of a tetra quark. Tetra quarks are there, even penta quarks are there. Mm -hmm. So there was this PC plus, PC plus, plus. I mean, I forgot the quark configuration, but they are there. But the thing is that why you can't have a tetra quark, that is the collection of four quarks with QQQQ. If you consider QQQQ, of course, if such quark at all exists in nature, that means if you three is not the correct theory of the color, you need to have four colors. But wait a minute. The charge assignments of the quark is already discovered through some things known as the, the deep inelastic scattering. That is how we came to know about the quark and other things. If you think about that, the charges are two third and minus one third. Take any possible combination. If you have four similar kind of quarks, it is impossible to get a final configuration which has integral charge. So from the viewpoint of the charge quantization, that is ruled out. But tetra quark state like CCC C bar, absolutely possible. And in fact, that is one of the things I think it was discovered in 2020 by LHCB collaboration. So those are there. 
so this is so you, you have to have a combination of uh, quarks and anti quarks and then you can have the possibility of obtaining more exotic quarks like structure exactly. like q q q otherwise you cannot quantize uh, the whole exactly. charge if you want to keep only quark then if you three hypothesis is only consistent if you again go to another state that is considering six quark because if you have six quark then i can keep like u u u even i can actually but then actually if you go to six quark you can still live absolutely fine with the free color hypothesis unless you discover a quark like 6u if you have u u u and d d d no problem free color hypothesis mm -hmm. is fine and u u u d d d so if you add it because the overall multiplication factor is 3 so 3 is going to neutralize your 2 your your 1 by 3 factor right so that is the reason <laughs> uh, okay i think uh, uh... Uh, we can uh, stop uh, today uh, and if you have any more uh, questions you can you can have those questions in your bag and uh, in the next uh, Saturday we will start from again from 11 a.m. sharp and yeah, then so, there will be lectures so I have about, about slides uh, for the standard model especially okay, for the mass so, generation so I will discuss that and then I will discuss some of the shortcomings of the standard okay. model before okay. that and the possible solution. <clears throat> so we will meet uh, maybe in, in the next 11 in the next Saturday 11 a.m. and after Randy. having a one and a half le half hours lecture. Huh? When the yes yes. Uh, tell tell the students to study in this line. Today we have really a very very simple but very informative presentation from our renowned speaker. So tell the mm -hmm. students to go through on this line so that we can have more interaction. Uh, next class maybe in the next day so yes ah, yes what yes. what what, what yeah. even is speaking so you need, need to learn and need to learn uh -huh. quickly before you before you sit in the next saturday's uh, class ah, because yes, yes. Uh, things will be uh, much more deeper uh, much more elaborate in the uh, next uh, class i guess so okay uh, i think uh, and, we can and, stop and, here and, and as advised by your teacher professor mitre so i have tried to keep things only in the level of the quantum mechanics and yeah, yeah, absolutely good, fine, absolutely fine. Very good, uh, very good. So, uh, okay, I think uh, we can stop here today's class. So, thank you, and we will join maybe in the next uh, next Saturday, sharp at eleven a.m. with the speaker. Okay, okay. so thank you, you, can, so you can. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. So, okay, okay, yeah, thank you, thank you.